fragile, disposable, fleeting by nature. Even when significant to someone, it wasn't made like a monument, built for its time, no further. But something delicate can still yield enduring insights, and powerful meaning can still be found in or forged from it. I found this book at an estate sale a few years ago, and while what initially drew my attention was the title, the decoration befitting it, and a fondness for old poetry anthologies, what thrilled me most was what I found within it while pouring through the thing later. I found a family portrait, a collage in fallen leaves that gave the silhouette of their time on earth. I don't know whether to call this a dissection or an exhumation. I'd like to think it's a bit more respectful than that, a bit less destructive, ultimately. I'm here to show you marks left behind by a hundred years of tucking memories between pages, or forming memories from them. Secondarily, I want to talk about ephemera in general, not all of it tucked between pages. The main thread, however, is this family's treasure. Our first insert is a poem clipped from newsprint, its acid casting a lasting shadow on the pages it nestled in. One of the more common things to find tucked in a book is something kin to the subject matter, a logical addition to, or extension of, the collection, the interest, the passion. Like in this French-German copy of Samuel Beckett's Fin de Partie, what we know in English as Endgame. It's also newsprint though a page uncut, a full page in German from some time ago. Friday, the 24th of October, 1969, with an article announcing Beckett's Nobel Prize for Literature. That was from someone else's treasure, though. This one has subtler, more personal gems. Things like these, desiccated, discolored, ever more frail than they were to begin with, but still beautiful, with just a shock of lingering color, violet. There are no words on this one. The weight of its meaning, the rationale of its placement, and the memory of its picking died with its preserver. I know I have unlabeled things that I find lovely. I know their stories. These acorns were collected on walks with my very best friend and stay in a bowl that she gave me on a shelf not far from my bed. The warmth of those associations make these keepsakes of comfort, and they tie to memories with great specificity. Back to the golden treasury. Another loose poem finds kinship in here. Some ode to domestic peace, warm and cozy. I'm happy when the shadows grow long across the lawn. Then mother folds her work away and puts an apron on. When, on some gilded cloud or flower, my gazing soul would dwell an hour, and in those weaker glories spy some shadows of eternity. Aha, now here's a message of a different sort. Not much to do with what's at hand in the book. Covetousness, the church's worst sin. They try to convince you to tithe more herein. Every age has its PSAs, whether dispensing truly pertinent information or more motivational in nature. What could be more salient than avoiding sin? 
Perhaps not the most thrilling artifact, but that depends on perspective. There's plenty to glean from the messaging of the day. More personal messages have something numinous to them, though. This card, once for sincere wishes, now holds Easter greetings, a clever way to capitalize on the season. How sensible they were in 1910. Here's one that's specific to a place, not a season. A beautiful place, if the painting is to be believed. We have a postcard from distant Glasgow, and a scene from Loch Katrin. Saw king and queen yesterday in Edinburgh. Helen's with me. One year later, we're having a grand time. Rip companions from afar. I tried to write you, but we get little time to write. For the price of a penny, it came across the Atlantic. Here's something sweet for the holidays. A good, strong message from a child's perspective. Dear Uncle Charlie must have been charmed. Correspondences, brief or lengthy, provide invaluable insight into how people live, who they are, and what they mean to each other. Sometimes they're found tucked in books, or written in them, but I keep many of those I value here. It's a stationary's order originally, so not the least fitting option, though not solely for letters. Maybe this is my treasury. Back to theirs. With quite a bundle. Another clipped morsel. Something steadying to guide them to where they hope to find life purpose. Because it gives you the chance to love, and, life. and to work, and to play, and to look up at the stars. To be satisfied with your possessions, but not contented with yourself until you've made the best of them. This, though, this is something very different. The crinkle of parchment is nerve-wracking, but the prize is something magical. A hand-drawn map of places that mattered to them. Southernmost at the top, northernmost at the bottom, and the west to the right. A good number of these towns no longer exist as such. Britannia, Cooksville, Arendale, and Streetsville all became part of what is now Mississauga. Palermo amalgamated with Oakville, Huttonville was swallowed by Brampton, Norval, Georgetown, and Acton all became part of the town of Halton Hills. And the elusive Primrose was split between townships, now at least partly in Malmer. This was crafted so deliberately, kept so long because it was useful. Ephemera is not all rhyme and reminiscence, it's reasoning, purposeful, practical. Now, I've found lists of places tucked in other people's books, but none so meaningfully arranged. Hey, this one came with a correspondence, at least. What are abundant in old books are notes. Whether notes on what to study next, or notes that comprise the study itself, but the juxtaposition of images that creates the emotional tone of a sequence. This grass of Parnassus was from the same estate sale as the Golden Treasury, the same family, this one, though, riddled with analysis, or unriddled for the reader. Piecing through subtext, context, pattern, and meaning. Picking through these poems the same way we're pouring over that treasury. Uncovering the sense in it, the pathos, the story. 
Back to that treasury, then, and another poem for the collection. We want troubles we can share. We want burdens we must bear. All the worries you recall do not frighten us at all. With this envelope, we leap ahead almost 20 years from the one to Uncle Charlie, which was written by a little Charlie, incidentally. How beautifully the colors have held up. It must be nearly as vivid as it was, or if not, imagine it. This too was from Charlie, and cherished. You'll notice I frame things with care and exclude things from view. As much as I want to share this, there's some privacy or dignity I don't wish to violate. Not with something so personal. Of course this, at first, seems about as impersonal as it gets. She's striking, surely. Is that enough reason to nestle her here? A pretty picture on an advert for China. Maybe. But as I move to settle her back into place, the position she marks strikes a chord. I saw where in the shroud did lurk a curious frame of nature's work, a floweret crushed in the bud. Why does someone need to hold this place? Or is it more that this place held them? Mr. Coolshaw does something to the woman's expression. But there are more stories to be told here, surely happier ones. And stories come in so many forms. Some to order. William Rennie Company was where one bought seeds in the twenties, and whoever this was, was an avid gardener. Mixture, sweet William. Forget-me-not. Early flowering sweet peas. Rennie's Spencer Grant mixture. Exhibition mixture pansies. Sweet-scented violets. Blue King. Klondike. Double begonia. So many plans on King this page. Hubbard. Yellow. All King. for three dollars. Receipts are not uncommon bookmarks. Again, though, they do bear insight. Even when tucked into the thing purchased, you learn the price. Maybe a store you didn't know existed? Here's a less commonplace record, though. A check for a room's rent in 1972. $12 for a week. Pretty manageable. You glean routines and events in people's lives from the plans and receipts they leave round. Sometimes less clear ones. Another pressed plant catches the eye. This one substantially more plain than the other, but much more relevant. Yarrow. Soldier's Wound War. At the time, I had some in my front yard. Mine was common yarrow, though. This seemed broader leaved, so I wondered if it might be something like fern-leaved yarrow. 
Even that doesn't seem quite right, though it's tricky to tell how desiccation and pressure might change the look of a thing over decades. And I'm not great with plants to begin with. Given the specificity of the last item's placement, I at first wondered whether this photo was, perhaps, of Yarrow, Scotland. And is this Yarrow? This the stream of which my fancy cherished so faithfully? A waking dream? An image that has perished? There have already been correspondences from Scottish sojourn, so perhaps a family connection. That said, the photo looks much like rural Ontario in winter, so could as easily be from there, and it may not have a family tie at all. I keep this photo around from a family road trip in my youth just because the building captivated me. Its decay peeling back layer after layer, sweating out the history of that old, abandoned house in the middle of nowhere, and giving me pause to muse about the little graveyard just further down the barren stretch of road. The way a photo can snag an echo from another place or time is awe-inspiring. As we near the end of this trove, the details shift from intimate, but uncertain, to firmer facts of whose hands it passed through. The Honorary Director of the 1911 Esquising Spring Show. This was no casual gardening family, indeed. A ribbon like that is held onto with pride, even if unspoken. It shows how others in their community may have valued them, what they may have grown in turn to self-identify as. Not all such rewards can slip in a book. Sometimes they are one. But looking through other books from the same sale as the treasury supports what we've found with that particular family. This collection of Robbie Burns poems was not nearly so stuffed as their other anthology, but again, the gardening theme stays true. The loveliest array of African violets. Passionate about plants, proudly Scots, and with no shortage of familial warmth in their values. What we love, that we see. What we see, that we are. At last I found this, in a book of great prose the world over. Perhaps the least telling thing in the collection, it seems. Well, the most identified. A driver's license from Ontario. Even as things come to light, they dither and crumble. The treasury's spine had seen the sun for far too long where it was kept, disintegrating on and just below the surface so that the simple act of paging through it might see it shed shards of itself. Everything is subject to entropy, but the things we care for are often better preserved than most.
The traces of identity we leave behind extend far beyond those that the government issued. They're the little things we recontextualize and find comforting along the way. The tokens that we save to remind us of our place on Earth. To remind us who we are. The words of loved ones. Or just words that resonate. Or wordless things whose meanings live entirely in memory. Maybe only ours. The debris of day to day that somehow sticks. Even things that fall into our hands from our ancestors, from strangers, from both, that change the way we see the world. As we go about our lives, we each build up a cache of context. And context is the soil in which understanding can take root. <laughs>